Tell them God loves you and so do I. Wherever you are, you may be in your homes. Tell them God loves you and so do I. Make sure you tell everyone, tell everyone who is with you. A lot of times we just need to be reminded of the beauty and the goodness of our God and his love for us to be encouraged and to be able to face a new tomorrow with courage and confidence. Praise the name of our Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Belle. Thank you, Celebration Team. It's always a joy to have all of you lead us into the very presence or usher us into the very presence of our God in worship. Praise God. You know, one of the great realities in the last days is the attractiveness of true believers. Why do I say that? Because I know we are, we are, we are like a polarization, a polarizing agent in this world. To some, we are a stench of death. To some, we are a stench that is, oh, not a stench, we are a fragrant aroma. Okay, but the reason I'm saying that is because honestly, when you look at the life of a believer, a life that is full of freedom, free of shame, or free from shame, guilt, and condemnation, a life that is full of joy and love and peace, who does not want that? Do you realize that people who are not even believers, who don't want to be Christians, see that in you and me? There's a reason why I told you the story about how in many Christian schools, there are many people or parents who enroll their kids who come from a religious persuasion, not even Christian, not even a part of quote-unquote Christendom. But they enroll, they enroll their kids in, in, in Christian schools because they appreciate the values and moralities and virtues of believers. They don't want to be Christians, but they do, they do appreciate what Christians do and who Christians are. And this is something that is very important, especially as we approach the last days. That's what we've been preaching about because one of the major characteristics of the last days is unforgiveness. And when you have unforgiveness, it's not a, a standalone characteristic. When you talk about for unforgiveness, it carries when a person is unforgiving, especially when you talk about people or entire generation or affecting even dual generations and more, when the world becomes that, it carries or it has a lot of baggage it brings with it. Things that are more serious than what we call about what we call unforgiveness. Now let me read to you in Second Timothy three, one through five again, listing all of those things that are characteristics characteristic of the last days. It says in Second Timothy three, one to five, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. It's almost like surprising that the Apostle Paul would tell you to stay away from people, right? Hey, Lord, we want to save them. Well, we're not going to discuss that today. Later on, we would. So we've listed down and dealt with the first nine of the, of the list of the characteristics of the last days. And these are them. This is sort of as, as a review. Self-lovers. Number two, money lovers. Number three, boastful. Number four, proud. Number five, God scoffers. Number six, disobedient to parents. Number seven, ungrateful. Number eight, unholy. And last week, we talked about being unloving. People who without love, without natural affection or People who are devoid of human affection, callous, inhuman, or inhumane. Like, that was sad, right? We talked about it last week. That was really sad. But today we continue. One of the things that actually we left with last week was these people were, will be heartless. Heartless. So today we continue. If you look at 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, 
we talked about being unloving last week. We tackled that today, unforgiving, unforgiving. So the original word for this, as unloving, appears only in the New Testament twice, actually in the entire Bible twice. This word unforgiving also appeared twice, only twice or two times in the Bible. The other one, same thing with the unloving wor verse, it also appears in Romans 1.31. You see it without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. Remember that? That's the unloving part, without natural affection. And then implacable or implacable, both are okay to say, okay, implacable or un implacable, and then unmerciful. So you look at that word implacable, that's in the King James Version I read. And the reason why I took that on the King James Version, because... It's interesting how in 2 Timothy, it is rendered as truce breakers. 2 Timothy is rendered as truce breakers. And then in Romans 1.31, the very same original word is rendered differently, okay, which is implacable or implacable. So and the reason why I pointed that out, because when I was researching on this word and the original and go, Lord, what are all the implications or possible meaning of this? I realized that this word, unforgiving, is so light. It is so limited. It is so constricted. And I'm letting you know right now, this word, unforgiveness, has one of the, of all the words or word studies I've made in New Testament words, this has one, probably this is, of, of my research is one of the words that has the most possible translations. Can you believe that? Unforgiveness. One of the words that has most possible translations. And the reason why I'm pointing that out to you is to show you once again that it's not something trivial or something light. When you say unforgiveness, this is something that covers a broad of attitudes that I'm going to show you right now based on the translations or possible renditions in the English language. What are you saying, Pastor? The nature of the Greek language and English comparison. The nature of the English language and Greek comparison is that a lot of times the original Greek word has a lot more meaning to it than English could translate. I've always given you this example coming from my province back home. You know, when you say thank you in our language, even in a native dialect, we have a direct statement to say welcome, okay, in our, in our dialect, welcome. But from the province where I come from, when we say welcome, it has another translation, which is deeper in meaning. What is that? The literal translation of the word welcome from my dialect is I will repay you back, in one word. In one word, I will repay you back. So we're not saying when somebody does us a favor, we're not just saying, I receive it, thank you very much, and the person says, welcome. The other person says, oh, no, but not, not welcome, by the way, thank you, the word thank you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so when, when you say the word thank you, we're not just saying thank you, I receive it. From our dialect, we're saying thank you, and I will repay you back. That's what it means for us to say thank you. So that's the kind of language translations that a lot of times English are not able to do, is not able to do when it comes to the Greek word. So let me show you now all the possible translations, meaning to say, Pastor, and I don't want you to ask, which one is the best? I want you to look at all of these things and put them all together because this is the context of the word unforgiving. So when I say later on unforgiving, you have all these things in mind, okay? So I'm not going to tell you the exact, like the meaning of like the, the acronyms there for the Bible translations because I'm more concerned about the meaning of the word forg unforgiveness. Look at this. In the King James Version, truce breakers. And they amplified irreconcilable. Okay, and I could, it's almost tempting to discuss every single one of them because all of them are important, right? Truce breakers, irreconcilable, implacable, unappeasable, contrary, hateful, without peace, merciless, uncooperative, never gives in to others unbending, cold-hearted. We talked about last week, heartless. Okay, this one is cold-hearted. And then, of course, in the Strong's, the, um, the dictionary, it, it talks about the definition of, some people may get confused about this, without libation. Okay, what is libation? Now, libation is the kind of drink that are often or is often used 
to either drink it or pour it on the ground as a sort of a, a sacrifice. So even this word without libation is telling us that this person is so unforgiving that even if the other party is trying to offer him something like sort of a peace offering, what he does is like, have you, girls, have you ever been d uh, betrayed by your boyfriend? And then they try to appease you by giving you flowers. And what did you do? You took the flowers and look at his eyes and then you went through the trash and throw it in the trash. Something like that. Something like that. They don't want to accept this kind of offering from you. Okay, that's, that's without libation. Okay, so but the gist of this or the general concept is that they have a broken relationship and that they would refuse any kind of attempt or any kind of possibility. That's why irreconcilable, unappeasable, implacable, all of these things, okay, without libation is because they don't want the relationship to be mended. They want it to keep... They want to keep the rift. They want to keep the chasm. They want to be separated. They don't want to accept anything that would be able to mend the relationship that they have. Okay, so if you look at something that is very interesting, by the way, in the Word of God, is the word forgiveness as Jesus <laughs> was like, I was reading, I was reading like, Lord, give me words about forgiveness. And a good story that you may have in the Bible about forgiveness. And I, saw, I found one. But what's very interesting is this Peter comes along and is like almost wanting to score before God. You know, it's like, Lord, you know the story, right? Like he was asking Jesus about forgiveness. And he wanted to appear to the Lord as somebody who's got it all. You know, it's like he's got it. He's got it. But one thing that is interesting in the way the Lord Jesus answers this is something that's surprising and yet creative and very effective. What do you mean by that? Peter was asking Jesus about forgiveness, and Jesus now gives a story about an unforgiving person. Remember that? Peter was asking about forgiveness, and Jesus gives a parable about an unforgiving person. But the beauty, f the, the beauty of our Lord is that as a great master teacher, he was able to open up doors of truths in Showing him the negative side of it, he was able to point out things that are very true that you and I need to pay attention about, okay? So this is something that I'm going to read to you. It's worth reading the entire parable, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. So many of you Bible scholars are very familiar with this, and we probably have a lot of Bible scholars here, amen? Praise God. You may be watching there. You probably know this. The moment I start reading this, you probably go, oh, I know that story. But I want you to listen, okay? I know you're a Bible scholar. We could always learn something new. Amen. Okay, Bible scholars, amen? Okay. <laughs> Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and asked. I could almost like, I almost chuckle when I read this because Peter was like really a funny, he's a really funny character, right? Like some of us. Okay, so... <laughs> And Peter came to him and asked, Lord, look at this, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Amazing. <laughs> Seven times? Now look at what Jesus Christ said. It's like Peter was like up and up and about, like with like almost almost coming to Jesus, probably full of pride. Like he's gonna he's gonna commend me for this. And Jesus just poured poured, poured cold water and like rained on his parade, right? Because Jesus said, after, after Peter says seven times, Jesus goes, no, not seven times. Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. That's a far cry from seven times. Seven to 490, right? Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king. Here goes a parable. Who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Everybody say millions of dollars. Anybody could identify? Anybody owe millions of dollars? Okay. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, that hurts, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. Okay, that hurts. That hurts, as, as well as many of us. If somebody is going to sell your wife, your children, just to pay the debt, everybody's going to say, ouch, right? Amen? Nobody's going to say, hallelujah. Take them all. Take them all. No, you're going to be hurt. And that's the moral of the story. The man fell down before his, but the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. I'll read it again. 
please be patient with me and I will pay it all. This guy thinks he is able to pay it. Okay? Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. How much? Millions of dollars. Okay, so as I said a while ago, how many of you can identify with this? How many of you owe millions of dollars? Right? So now let me ask you, if somebody owes you millions of dollars, how many of you would want to forgive the debt of a person owing you millions of dollars? This is not easy. So I want you to take it with you. I want you to identify with this. Don't just read it like that, okay? I, I want you to see and feel with the characters of the story to see the weight of the uh, parable that Jesus was giving to them, okay? Filled with pity, he released him and forgave his debt. Verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Now say thousand dollars, okay? He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, saying almost the very same thing he said. He goes, be patient with me, and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Now, there's a lot of good truths there in the story, but one thing it behooves me to point out to you right away, that Jesus is a very sharp and stern words of warning and caution about judging people who are unwilling to forgive. So you see that story. Okay, I'll say that again. Jesus is a very stern, sharp, very bad warning and caution to people. Words of judgment to people who are unwilling to forgive. They're going to have a bad time. They're going to have a, a horrible time. They're going to have a really bad judgment. Now listen carefully. But that's going to be the attitude of the people in the last days. Are you following me now? Let's make the connection. Peter said that's going to be the attitude of the people in the last days. People are going to be forgiving. Um, unforgi I'm sorry, unforgiving. Unforgiving, okay? So what it's saying is, People will be under the judgment of God in the last days. People will be living in the last days, but they're going to be under the umbrella, not, not umbrella of blessing, but umbrella of judgment and curse because that's what God said about people who are unforgiving. And that's not a standalone story. But pastors, you know, it's like the Bible says, um, you cannot just get one verse or one scripture or one passage or one story and then establish a matter regarding that. Well, you know what? The Bible actually, there's so much that I have to literally limit the number of verses I'm going to present to you because there are so many verses about God's warning regarding unforgiveness. But let me share to you some, starting with the very first part that we had in this parable. Okay. Mark 18, Matthew 18, 21 to 22. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? What was the master's answer? No, not seven times, but 70 times seven. That is, by the way, the context of this based on what I've learned, I don't know how true, but the context of this based on many of the readings I had regarding the, the, the culture of the day. When Peter approached Jesus Christ about seven times, he was referring to not the lifetime he has. He was referring to forgiving somebody seven times in the same day. Are you hearing me? Is anybody, has anybody done you wrong one time in a day and you had a hard time forgiving? Huh? Anybody? Anybody had done you wrong in a day, one time, and you had a hard time forgiving? In fact, you did not just not forgive him in one day. You carried that burden. You carried that grudge with you for years. One time, they made a mistake. According to this, Peter said, he asked seven times in a day. Jesus answered 
70 times 7. Now listen carefully. Do not get your calculator and try to multiply that. For those of you mathematical genius, no, it's not 490 times. It is 490 times through calculator and, and, and your multiplication. But the gist of the story is not that you count. It's like, like you wrong me, one, okay? I'm going to I'm going to have a list throughout the day. Once you get to 490 and it's 1159, don't make another mistake because I'm going to smack you. That's not the gist of the story. The gist of the story is Jesus was saying you got to forgive always. Always because I don't think anybody would wrong you 490 times in a day anyway. Right? I don't think anybody would wrong you. I remember sorry like count you know about this counting kind of thing. Counting kind of thing. Like a person got married person just got married i forgot man I, it just like i don't know the story I don't, if, I don't know if i can recall it but i'm trying i'm gonna try just something a little bit okay what story about this couple or fiance fiance that they're, they're about to get married and they went horseback riding and then and then and then the lady says because he was trying to like get the horse moving and he goes move you know and and the horse didn't didn't move and and the lady goes that's one uh, and then he goes, move. And the horse didn't move. And the lady goes, that's two. And then she finally, she kicked the horse again and, and tried to, like, pull the rope and goes, move. And then and, and whatever they say to make the horse move, right? I don't know what they say. What do they say to make the horse move? <laughs> well, I don't know what it is. But the horse still didn't move. And she goes, that's three. That, according to this story, this is just a story, okay, not a true story. I hope it's not. Okay, so he goes, okay, you go, and right? and it still didn't move. And she goes, that's three, got down, took the shotgun from the saddle, and then, boom, shot that horse, right? And a fiance, like, the guy got, got so scared, like, what did you just do? And then the lady looked at him and goes, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> Scary. Scary. <laughs> talk about talk about counting the number of times they, they, they need forgiveness from us. But this is something that I'd like to show you. He's going, he's going, you got to forgive and be willing to forgive every time. And this is something that is very important. Listen carefully. I'm going to point something that's closer to home. Uh, I could give examples about the house. I could give examples about the church. Or you, could, you could apply this to any or in your workplace. A lot of times the problem that we have even is not about forgiving. Okay? Um, a lot of times, like, we, we tend to just look at a person's mistake and we magnify a person's mistake so that we will be justified in not forgiving the person's mistake. Are you following me? Like stories about how people, many times people have come to me um, and they talk, they come to church and they talk to me about their relatives who attend a different church, like at their aunt, their uncle, and, and they go, Pastor, my, 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 my aunt and uncle left the church where they're attending. And, I, and they mentioned the church to me, and I, I, I would, I've heard of the pastor, I've heard of the church, and these are beautiful, wonderful, nice people, nice churches. And, and they would go like, and, and, and I go, why did they leave? And I go, well, because there's a rumor about the son of the pastor doing this, or the pastor actually getting all the money, you know, the usual thing, or the pastor said something like this, like this. And then I look at the words that they're saying, and they're very light. A lot of times they're very light, and, and they just magnify that. And then I start probing and i go um do they do, does your aunt and uncle attend regularly oh not really pastor you know it's like so i start probing into the possible condition of the spiritual lives of the people who's blaming the pastor or the church leaders that's the reason why they don't attend church and a lot of times if not 100 percent of the time i would be concluding that despite let's say even that your comments and your illustrations or your examples for the reason that the leader or that your uncle or auntie or your relative left the church, let's say even that they are true. The, the reality, though, is that even if that was true, that pastor and that leader is still serving the Lord way more and is still devoted to the Lord way more and is still going through the spiritual discipline, reading the Word of God, attending Bible studies, sharing the gospel, attending church way more than the people who you say are complaining against them for that simple thing. Are you following me? And they feel the need of accusing somebody and carrying that grudge that they now don't want to reconcile or be appeased or have a mending a broken relationship. They just 
want to ship off and go somewhere else. When in reality, you just magnified something. So we're a lot of people, people are not only guilty of not being willing to forgive. We're guilty of actually magnifying the fault of people. And it is something that's, that's going to happen to the world around us. But God forbid that it continues happening in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We are going to be known by our love for each other. Listen carefully. Not because we're not going to be known because of our complaints against our brothers and sisters. Are you here with me? There's nothing in the Bible that says all men will know that you are my disciples if you're able to prove that your pastor is a jerk. Are you here? Nothing like that in the Bible. Okay? There's, there's nothing that says all men will know that you are my disciples if you're able to prove that the, you're the most spiritual among all of them compared to all the people in the church. Nothing like that at all. All men will know that you are my disciples. So this is very, very important, especially we're talking about the last days. When we got to let the people, or we get to let, we have to let the people know that they are true people of God. That you, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. John 13, 35. That's what it says. Okay? So let me read to you some other Bible verses that talks about forgiveness. Okay? Mark eleven twenty five. Again, out of the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter established. Here you go. Not just a parable. I've given you two now. I'm going to give you five. Okay, Mark 11, 25. But when you are praying, just first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. What is the context of this? I believe this applies a lot more to believers. Okay, Have you ever come to God in prayer knowing that there's something that you have, a grudge or resentment that you're still carrying in your heart against other people? God is basically saying there's a requisite. Before I listen to you, I'm not going to listen to you until you're able to forgive somebody first. If we're asking God for forgiveness, God is saying, again, I, some of we, this is a long discussion, especially when it comes to the sphere of grace, but it's a reality. These are statements from the Bible. These are statements from the Lord Jesus himself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So there's a requisite on God's forgiveness. What is that? We've got to forgive others as well. That's very true with that verse. Amen? Okay? Amen? Okay, so we've got to be willing. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we operate on, this, uh, on a different standard. The world will not forgive. It's okay for them to pray. It's okay for them to offer sacrifices to their God without actually forgiving people. But for believers like you and I, hallelujah, we live in a very different standard. We're not hypocritical. So before we ask for forgiveness, okay, before we ask for a million-dollar forgiveness, we got to be able to forgive the thousand-dollar debt. Amen. Okay, so now the next one. Ephesians chapter 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Very same thought, Colossians 3, 13. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. You must forgive others. So what it is saying is this. He's leveraging, the Apostle Paul is leveraging on God's forgiveness based on the parable that we read a while ago. He's leveraging on God's forgiveness of you and me to be a, a sufficient and appropriate reason for us to forgive others as well. Because I remind you again, what does the parable say? God has forgiven you millions of dollars. Okay, not literal. Okay, God has forgiven you with millions of dollars. We ought to forgive those who owe, uh, who owe us thousands of dollars. Now, for believers, this is a reality. Every single person who consider yourself a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we all got forgiven by God with a tremendous amount of faults, flaws, and sins and wrongs in our lives. True? Yes, it is. So the context of the parable is this, the reality of Christianity is that if your brother or sister sins against you, remember the context, 490 times in a day. Because the parable was given after Jesus said that. Are you hearing me? I want to bring your attention to this because that is so, um, that is terrifying. Pastor, people sinning against us 490 times in a day, 
let's say, for example, that becomes a reality. Jesus is saying, even if this person sins against you 490 times in a day and sins against you again the next day and sins against you again the next day, even if this person constantly sins against you 490 times every day, he said, accumulate all of them and the forgiveness that you have received from me is still way much greater than the forgiveness I'm asking you to give your fellow man. The forgiveness I'm asking you to give each other is infinitesimal. It is so small. It is extremely little when it comes to the forgiveness all of you have received from me. So what Jesus is saying is, since God has forgiven us already so hugely, every time somebody sins against you, the default will be forgive. There ought to be no time in the life of a believer that we're not going to forgive anyone. Okay, I want you to put that in your mind and in your heart. Etch it deep down there. There is not one instance or reason when, an un, when, when a believer ought to be unforgiving to anyone for anything about anything. Okay? Hebrews 12, 14 to 15. This will be the last witness verse I'm going to show you. But this is a lot. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I'm going to spend a little time on this one, okay? Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness. By the way, I was trying to research on this and study this, and there's a almost common agreement with everybody that the root of bitterness has to do with unforgiveness. But I want you to watch out what the verse says, okay? The verse says, watch out that no poisonous, when you talk about, if that was true, if unforgiveness, implicability, irreconcilability, a person not willing to give in, a person unbending, a person will, not willing to concede anything. So you could get all of those things again. No oblation, can't give, give an offering to him. Person who just wants to keep this distance, okay? When a person has that, look at what's going to happen. Watch out that description. Number one, no poisonous. Unforgiveness is poisonous. Hear with me? Unforgiveness is poisonous. Unforgiveness is something that is inside of you. And when we are unforgiving, because the world will be unforgiving, that's the reason why many of them are angry, is because there's something that's eating them up and destroying them from the inside. That's what unforgiveness is. Okay? It's poisonous. It's also a root. Meaning to say it goes deep. Unforgiveness goes deep. And then next, it talks about root of bitterness. It is bitter. How many of you like bitter stuff? No, right? I mean, sometimes, yeah, like for, for a, um, a tinge of, a pinch of bitterness. For example, chocolate. I like chocolate a little bitter. But I don't want it to be completely bitter. Right? Coffee. There's a little bitterness on coffee. I want a little bit bitter, but you don't want bitterness itself as a taste. According to this, the taste, it's, it's like it leaves a bad taste in a person. And now, if you apply this again to a generation, to a group of people, it's basically saying it leaves a bad taste in the world. And here lies, again, the importance of you and I being salt. Remember, you are the light of the world, and you are the salt of the earth. And we talked about salt as what? Every time we talk about salt, the first thing that comes to your mind is what? Preservation. Amen? And that's true. We are here to preserve this world. Well, let, listen carefully. I want to talk to you about uh, the challenge I have right now. It's almost being driven towards or impelled inside of me to start talking about the book of Revelation. And, and one of the things that, that is very important truth in the book of Revelation is that the Antichrist will be coming. The Antichrist will be revealed. But listen, listen, listen carefully. But the revelation of the Antichrist will not happen until the what they call the restrainer is taken away. Now, when the word when the word of God talks about restrainer, the most common interpretation of the word restrainer is the Holy Spirit or the church in which the Holy Spirit lives in. So we and you and I, as salt of the earth, are preservers and restrainers. Are you following me? We're the one that is restraining evil from coming full blown from manifesting full-blown or expressing themselves full-blown here in our society. Listen carefully. Why do I have hope for America despite 
all the chaos and all the craziness going on. Why? Why do I have hope for America? <laughs> why do I have hope? Why do I have hope for America? Huh? Why? Because there's a restrainer. There's a preserver. What do you mean, Pastor? The reason why America has hope is because there's the church. Take away the church from this nation. You know where this nation is going to go. But as long as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ exists in this country, this country will be A-OK. -okay. But, well, Pastor, I'm not doing my job. There will be people that God is going to raise up. If you don't do your job, there will be people that God is going to raise up who will do the job. That's my hope. That's my confidence. But there will come a time that the restrainer will be taken. That's the reason, as I said, in the world, it will be full of bitterness. Imagine when the church is taken out. It will be nothing but bitter. But you and I as salt, we're not only restrainer, but let me give you this. This is something that is so obvious that we often forget. You are not just a restrainer. You're also providing taste. Bitterness is such a bad taste. The world is saying, God is saying, you are going to be salty in the earth. Now, some of you are like, I don't want salt. You know what? Ask people who have high blood pressure, how they get tempted a lot of times to eat, like, things with salt, right? Because it tastes good. Makes you want to Do you know what salt does? It makes you want to eat more. Makes you want to eat more. So that's what the attractiveness of believers. Remember I told you in the beginning that Christians will be attractive? Because through the life of a believer, a life that is full. Remember again, there's so much more to say. But anyway, if you, look at, if you look at unforgiveness, when a person lives in unforgiveness, they are not forgiven by God. And if they're not forgiven by God, they're experiencing what? Shame, guilt, condemnation. When a person is not willing to forgive others, what's going on? There's like a rift. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no love. And when you have that, what's going to happen to your life? It's awful. It's filthy. It's dirty. That's the kind of life you're going to live without, without forgiveness. But God is saying, because my people are there. Because my people are there. You see people that are forgiven by God. And because they're forgiven by God, they're enjoying a life free from guilt, free from condemnation, a life of freedom, a life of love, a lot of joy, a, a life of joy, and a lot of a life of peace. That's a beautiful, attractive life that people are going to gravitate to. But that's the reason why you and I, people of God, we're going to matter so much in the end. We're going to matter so much in the end because you and I will be will be beacons of light of forgiveness that people so desperately need. When people are out there feeling filthy, dirty, and lousy. And in dark, you and I will be the light shining. And people are going to look at you and say, I want what they have. I want what they have. And people are sincerely looking for what is good, what is right, and what is godly. Guess what? God has positioned you in their lives so that they would see the beauty of a life of a believer. That they would see the beauty of a life of the God of a believer, of the believer. Amen? That's the beauty of a life that is lived in forgiveness. In forgiveness. And so let me just call you again. This For all of us, for all of us, my prayer is that we will really be very different. My prayer is that we, as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be people who do not carry anything that is heavy. It's like somebody has said before, there are a lot of things that you could read about unforgiveness. Somebody has said before, my, my sister-in-law said, you know what unforgiveness is? Unforgiveness is like you holding on to a coal, a burning coal, and expecting another person to be burned. Unforgiveness is like you drinking poison and expecting the other person to fall. That's what unforgiveness is, they said. I also read something that says, a great woman or a great wife is a person who's so willing to forgive when she knows she's wrong. A great wife is a wife who's so willing to forgive when she knows she's wrong. That's supposed to be a joke. You get it later on. Now my challenge for you seriously is this. There's a huge difference between a life of someone who has been set free because unforgiveness is a poison on the inside and a crushing weight on the outside. You may be experiencing some difficulties in your life where something is eating you up because of a grudge or a resentment or a hurt feeling that you've been carrying all along. 
for many of you for a long time now, now listen carefully, some of you, because of what has happened to the world around us, you're not just angry with your family, you're even angry with yourself, or if you're not angry with yourself, you're even angry with the government. If you're not angry with the government, perhaps, listen carefully, I'm saying this lovingly because they may, this may be true with you, you may be angry at God. Of all people, you're angry at God. That is a serious situation that you ought to remedy right away. God is just being patient with us because he loves us. But let's not get comfortable having that kind of position. But if you're a person who has not yet experienced a wonderful gift of freedom and forgiveness that comes from God, that's the first call we want to have for you. Do you want to experience liberty? Do you want to experience a life that is free? Where he says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is inviting you. Receive his forgiveness. You could stop carrying the guilt and shame and judgment okay, from your heart. Throw it before God and release it to him. All you got to do is receive the gift of the Son of God, who is the one forgiving you of your sins. Okay, for those of you who probably have, listen, I'm going to lead in prayer. But for those of you who may be listening, don't listen to this as if that's for somebody. That's for somebody. If you or I have somebody that you're not in good terms with, especially because of the tension that's going on with politics right now, do you realize that there are family members who are not talking to each other? because of this do you realize that there are people who have unfriended there are people I, I know at least one person who have unfriended me unfriended me just because of my political stand but I got to do something you and I has got to do something reach out once you've reached out then it's on them it's on them but you got to do it got to do it you got to keep the peace so now I'm going to call you oh, that's, that's, I leave that on you because I don't have time anymore make sure if you haven't forgiven people call them on your phone don't even wait for your home before you leave today call them and make amends and for those of you who want to receive Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior I'm going to lead you in prayer open your heart to him he's going to set you free he's going to take away all those baggage he's going to take away the heaviness in your heart because he is just so willing. His grace is greater than all your sins. Just bow your head right now. All of you who are here also, bow your heads. I want you to pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart. Those of you who are here, pray this together with those doing this for the first time, whether there's live stream or a replay. It'll be as powerful. It'll be as true. Say this all together from the bottom of your heart, with your lips, loudly. Dear God in heaven, Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. That despite the fact I've sinned against you many times over, now I have the assurance that it is in your heart to forgive me. Lord, I want that forgiveness. I want to be free from condemnation from guilt, from shame. So I open my heart to you and I'm inviting you. Please come into my heart. Come into my life. I place my faith, my trust, my full dependence on you, Jesus, for my salvation. And I surrender my life to you. You as my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me of all my unrighteousnesses. Come into my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Help me now, Lord, to forgive those who sinned against me. Help me to follow you faithfully from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God.
I want to talk to you if you praise God. Amen. Go ahead. Give the Lord a big round of praise. Again, act of faith. We believe that there will be people who will be saved, who will be saved through this telecast or through this video. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, anytime, whether this live stream or as a replay, make us know. Let us know about it. Call us. Communicate with us. Telephone. Leave comments in the comment section. Through our email, whatever it may be, because let me assure you, this is the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Nothing is more valuable than this. And we would like to be able to celebrate with you as the heavens have celebrated with you. And we want to be able to walk with you in this journey. Congratulations. God bless.